Um, you know, there's some verses, I mentioned this a couple of years ago when I was preaching through the book of um, First Kings, we were talking about the prophet Elijah, and I mentioned that there's some verses that never make it to a coffee cup. You know, um, sometimes you get a coffee cup verse or you get a, a, a plaque that goes on the wall and it's got a verse on it. And, and I mentioned that uh, in First Kings, there was a verse that would never make it onto a coffee cup until one of our student ministers, uh, student ministry staff people decided that they wanted to make me that cup with that verse on it. <laughs> and so I have a cup in my office that says, and Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape, and Elijah brought them to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. <clears throat> Probably the only one that has a coffee cup with 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 40 on it. And there's another verse in our passage today that will probably never make it to a coffee cup, which is Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was Greek. <laughs> no, that is not a request. <laughs> I'm not asking for a new gift. But the reality is, is that sometimes um, these verses that we come across are a little bit challenging. Sometimes they're hard to understand. Sometimes the Bible can be difficult to understand. Um, if you're connected to the right people or maybe the wrong people online, uh, it won't take much poking around in order for you to find a church or a denomination or a pastor who claims to have an exclusive corner on the truth. Um, they're out there. These groups often know and loudly proclaim exactly how a church should happen, what should be done. They will tell whoever's listening what they should believe, what songs should be sung, and how loud they should be sung, how they and their followers should interact with culture, how we should dress, how we should vote, or if they should vote, and more and more and more. You can find all kinds of people online <laughs> if you're following the wrong people. In extreme, uh, their conclusion is usually something like, we have the secret sauce, and if you want to get the gospel right, you will do it like us. If you do it differently than us, you might not even be a Christian. And I've heard that particular line more recently uh, among groups that really call into question, if you're not doing it the way that we're doing it, you might not even be saved. You never know where these voices are going to come from, and at times you don't have to even go looking for them. Sometimes they'll show up and just come and find you. I had a group on our campus that told me that our church was influenced by Satan and that I was a false preacher. They came to me to tell me that. I didn't invite them. <laughs> And no matter how I might feel about that kind of a messenger, and believe me, my feelings go all over the place in those moments, you can be sure that the message of being accused of a false teacher is something that I would take extremely seriously. A charge like that would cause me to stop, to pause, to think, to pray, to go back to Scripture and ask the question, what is the gospel actually? What does the gospel require? And, and Galatians chapter 2 really helps us to answer that question. What does the gospel require? You remember, we're studying through the book of Galatians for the next couple of weeks. We'll take a little break around Christmas, and we'll come back to it in the new year. But the book of Galatians is a letter that was written from a man named Paul, the Apostle Paul, and it's written to a group of churches in the, what's modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, and he's addressing these kind of questions. What is the gospel? What does the gospel require of us? Here in the churches around Galatia, people have responded to preaching. They've responded to the proclamation of who Jesus is under Paul's preaching. And then Paul moves on and others have come in telling the Galatian Christians that there's another step that they need, need to take. And in fact, they may not actually be saved because they haven't done all that they need to do. Galatians 1, verse 6, Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to this different gospel, which he goes on to say is not a gospel at all. The different gospel that these Judaizers are preaching 
is that those who are coming to faith in Jesus as Messiah have done step one, but there's actually step two or step three, four, five, and six that they need to also do. And they're missing those steps. And Paul says anyone who is preaching this gospel is actually doomed for destruction. That's what he says in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 1. He uses very strong language to say this is actually not a gospel at all. If they're telling you to do something in addition to what I have told you to do, do not listen to them, even if they are an angel, even if it's someone from my team who's coming to tell you, that, even if they're, they're another apostle comes and gives you a message other than what I've given you, don't listen to them. And so if you've never read through the entire book of Galatians, I'd encourage you to do that over the next couple of weeks. Uh, it would take you about 30 minutes, probably at a regular pace, reading through uh, the chapters that are there. And I'd encourage you to do it. And, and, and Paul wrote this as, as one letter. It's one thought. And, and we kind of break it up into sections in order to kind of look at it and understand it. But, but that's not necessarily the way that Paul wanted us to read it. It's better, I think, to understand it all in its context. But today we're going to look at just these verses that VJ read for us. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Because what we see here is that as, as, as Paul is finishing up Galatians chapter 1, he's warning them not to follow false teachers, and then he answers the natural question that would be in their mind, Paul, how do we know that you're not a false teacher? And at the end of chapter 1, he gives four different reasons why he's not a false teacher. Number one, he says his message is given by Jesus. That's a really good reason. <laughs> I met Jesus. Jesus told me to say this. I'm telling you what Jesus told me to say. Number two, he says, Jesus completely changed my life. Uh, I have a story, and my story was destruction. I wanted to destroy the church. I wanted to destroy Christians, and, 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 and that was the path that I was on, and, and Jesus completely changed change my life. Thirdly, he says, Jesus commissioned me. He gave me a, a charge to go preach to the Gentiles. I'm not a false preacher, Paul says, because I'm here. Uh, who else is coming to you to tell you about this salvation? And fourthly, he says, I don't actually need anyone's approval, but just so you know, Peter and James thanked God for what he is doing in me. At the end of chapter 1, you see that. They glorified God because of what was happening in Paul's life. And so as we look at chapter 2, Paul says to us and to the reader, to the churches of Galatia, now I want to get back to this false gospel that some of you are believing, and I want to tell you why this false gospel is unnecessary. I want to tell you why the extra things that they are asking you to do are unnecessary. I want you to see that the message they are giving you, these Judaizers are giving you, is a false gospel. Remember, we said that a Judaizer is somebody who is a follower of Jesus from the Jewish community who is requiring Jewish practices on anybody who becomes a follower of Jesus. And so they were okay with Gentiles, non-Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus as long as their coming to faith in Jesus was followed up with then going with the Old Testament, Old Covenant practices, namely circumcision and all that follows. So this is what Paul is responding to. What does the gospel require? And as we look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we see that the gospel is, first of all, never about anything other than Jesus. The gospel is never about anything other than Jesus. This whole idea of circumcision, I'm not going to take time to unpack for you. But circumcision was a physical act that the Jewish community did to the men who were in their community as a means of marking them as part of the covenant community. Why God chose circumcision, I don't know. Um, but it was, a, it was a religious 
activity. It, was, it marked them as being part of the Jewish community. And, and what Paul is saying here is that circumcision is not necessary to be identified with Jesus. In fact, what Paul is saying is that there is nothing other than Jesus that is necessary for being identified with Jesus. And this, though, might be something that we can easily get our head around. It's not something that we easily practice because whether we know it or not, our tendency is to also put conditions on faith. Where we say we, we believe that it's, it's necessary to follow Jesus, yes, but it would also probably would be good for you to clean up this and to do that and to maybe look this and stop saying that and do this and do this and do this and do this. And we add layers. We add things that if you don't do all the stuff that we think that you should do, then maybe you're actually not saved. And we'll talk about obedience in just a moment, but this is what Paul wants us to begin to think about because he says in verses one through three, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me, and I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed to be influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. Now, before I read verse 3, where it talks about Titus, but even Titus who was with me, Paul is not saying, I went to Jerusalem, and as I went to Jerusalem, I found those who were important, those who were influential, and I checked my gospel against theirs in order to make sure that my gospel was okay. When he says I'm not, I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure I wasn't running in vain, Paul's not saying, I want to make sure that I have it right. In fact, he's saying just the opposite. Paul's saying, I want to make sure that they have it right. Because remember, Paul has already said, I got this message from Jesus. I don't have any question as to its authority. In fact, if anybody were to come and say something to me that is different than what I am saying, I would say that person is accursed. That person is condemned. That person is in trouble. And so Paul is not coming in order to say, I want to make sure that my gospel is okay, that my gospel is all right. He's saying, I want to make sure that what they're saying in Jerusalem is right. I want to make sure that they're preaching the gospel correctly. I want to make sure I'm not running in vain in the sense that, I'm fight, that we're fighting against ourselves by having two different messages. Paul's desire is that the clarity of the gospel would be crystal clear. You remember last week, Corey helped us to understand the difference between man's gospel and God's gospel. Put up this little chart that was in the notes last week where man's gospel tends to be about you. It affirms you. It relies on you. Paul said, I don't want man's gospel. I don't want your opinion about how something should go. We want to be preaching God's gospel. God's gospel is about God. It's about Jesus. It changes you. It, it relies on him. It's dependent on him. It has nothing to do with what we can do for ourselves. It's completely dependent on who God is. And the reality is, is that if the gospel is never about anything than Jesus, then all of the Old Testament law is actually not over us. Okay. The Old Testament law has no bearing on us. You say, Jeff, what are you saying? Don't follow the Ten Commandments? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the Old Testament law is not how we get to salvation. Let me back this up with some scripture. It's a good idea. Why don't you go there? Romans chapter 7. You're not going to see this on the screen. You should just write it down or flip there or highlight it, whatever. Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But, Paul says in Romans 7, we are now released from the law 
having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of written codes. The old law, Paul says, is behind us. We have a new law that is in front of us. He says that also in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and following. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And how has he done this, Paul asks? By abolishing the law of commandments that's expressed in ordinances in order to create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The old law has been done away with. Our new law is Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 11. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision that was made without hands. In Jesus, he's saying, you You also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, which the New Testament declares as a circumcision of our hearts, not of our flesh. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And then he goes on to say, and you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside and nailed it to the cross. The law is dead. The Old Testament law is dead. Galatians, later in this book, in chapter 3, verses 23 and following, Paul will write these words, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law. We were imprisoned until the coming faith to be revealed. So then, the law was given as our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 8, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You say, Jeff, what's the point? My point is this. The Old Testament law is not our law. Our law is Jesus. Now, Think about this in terms of an illustration. If you have a last will and covenant, some of you have written a will. Some of you have written your will and have changed your will because of life circumstances through the years. Can I get a nod? Anyone understand what I'm talking about? Yes, you understand this. If you were to pass away, which will would be in effect? The old one or the current one? The current one. The old one would actually have no bearing on anything anymore because it's been put, to, it's done, right? The new law is the new will is going to be the will that you follow. These are the instructions. Now, might there be overlap between the old will and the new will? Yes, and with the old covenant, there might be overlap between how we should live and what we should do and and what morality looks like. There will be overlap with the new covenant, but the new covenant comes through Jesus. It is not dependent upon the law. Do you see the illustration? It's important that we recognize that we are not obligated to respond to Old Testament law as a means to find salvation, In fact, the Old Testament law was given to the people as a way to prove to them you actually can't do this on your own. That's why we have to do sacrifices. That's why we go to the temple. That's why we do all the things we have to do because we're trying to make atonement for our sins, which we have to do every year, the author of Hebrews says, over and over again because we can't do it by ourselves. But when Jesus came, the old was put to death. Behold, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, is a new creature. 
Old things have been put down. New things are coming. The law that we live under today is the law of Jesus. And so what Paul wants the Galatian believers to understand is that there is nothing that you need to add to Jesus in order to be saved. Nothing. Nothing you can add to Jesus. Jesus only. Not Jesus plus circumcision. Not Jesus plus Sabbath obediences. Not Jesus plus yearly sacrifices. Not Jesus plus anything. Jesus is the way to salvation. And anybody, he says in chapter one, who tells you anything different, they can be a curse for all I care. They can go away. They don't listen to them. They are a dangerous person. The gospel is never about anything but Jesus. Now, if I'm going to receive the gospel that Jesus offers, the good news of salvation through Jesus that actually saves me from my sin, secures for me my present, and makes for me a hope in the future, if I'm going to listen to that Jesus, wouldn't it make sense that I believe him and I obey him? You see, this is where obedience comes in. We believe Jesus, but we don't just say, I believe you, and then we sit back and do whatever we want. Paul says, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? No, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. If we believe him, then we will do what he says. Jesus says that himself. If you believe me, you'll you'll do what I say. You'll follow after me. Your life today is lived in obedience to Jesus, not obedience to Old Testament law. Whatever Jesus says we should do, we should do. We should take Jesus' words really seriously. That's convicting, because Jesus says some hard stuff. In fact, Jesus calls us to be more than just church attenders. In fact, the concept of a Western church might look really weird to Jesus. He calls us to do more than just give an offering. He calls us to more than just praying. In fact, one of the ways in which we are obedient to Jesus is by looking to the needs of others, which is exactly how this passage ends. By being a compassionate person. By not having our eyes only on us. See, one of the reasons why the church's testimony in the world is challenged and questioned is because many people see the church only caring about itself and not caring about the lost. They see more grace and altruism being given through secular organizations than given through the church. They see more care and compassion being demonstrated by those who don't claim the name of Jesus than sometimes by those who do claim the name of Jesus. Friends, it should not be this way. The church should be out front. We, the people of God, should be out front caring for those who do not know, praying for those who are lost and broken, having compassion, meeting the needs of the sick, praying for those who are, who are sick and, and, and unable to care for themselves, looking after orphans and widows in their distress. As James says, this should be what the church is all about. It's not just about attendance. It's not just about putting on your blazer and coming to church and feeling good about the way you look that day. It's about the circumcision of the heart. It's about Jesus actually having reign and rule and authority over every aspect of our lives, all of our lives being put in submission to him. Everything we do. I'm not hearing as many amens for this part. It hurts, right? It's, it, it should cause us to, re, to, to think, like, what is the part of my life where I think I'm just getting by in my religious activity instead of actually submitting myself to his rule and his reign? Where are the parts of my life where I, I look to external things to satisfy me more than I actually look to Jesus? Where are the parts of my life where I'm more concerned about the future that I can secure for myself than the future that he has already secured for me? This hurts. This is hard. 
This is difficult. Paul says, the only gospel, the only gospel that you need to hear and listen to is the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is never about anything other than him, but it's all about him and everything that he's about. Secondly, he says the gospel produces freedom, not restriction. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. The gospel produces freedom, not restriction. Yet because of false brothers who were secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, why? So that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. There are some, these Judaizers who he's referring to, who have slipped in in order to spy out our freedom. They say, you're not doing enough. You're not doing the Old Testament. You're not requiring the things of the law. And they're spying out our freedom. Why? In order to bring us back into slavery. If you are in Christ, you've been set free. Set free. Not required to live under the expectations of man. Not required to live under the expectations of the Old Testament law. Not required to live under the expectations of the people around you. You are free in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, as I said earlier. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. The gospel produces freedom, not restriction. Which means that sometimes our own culture can get in the way of freedom. And we end up being kind of reserved or cautious or tepid in what, what our heart really feels about what God has done and about what God is doing. And shouldn't we be a people who are free to say, thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. Thank you for your goodness. Shouldn't we be a people who are free to declare, God, you have been so good to me. And not be intimidated and not be reserved or not be held back by the fact that maybe other people will think I'm weird. Who cares what other people think if I'm praising God for the freedom that he has given me? Who cares what people think? I'm not doing this to impress anybody. I just want to say thank you. I just want to praise him. I just want him to know that I am not being restricted in any way because the gospel produces freedom. Man's laws bring us back into slavery. Number three, the gospel pulls people together under a unified mission. See, the problem that, P, that Paul was seeing in the early church was that if we're not careful, if, if I'm preaching the gospel that Jesus gave to me and other people are preaching a different gospel, then this thing is going to splinter quickly. This thing is going to splinter quickly and it's going to be impotent in a matter of years. You know one of the threats to the testimony of the churches? The fact that we have so many different churches under so many different denominational names who split and turned and decided to do this and this and this and this out of convenience or out of preference or out of desire for the way that I like things to be. And how much more power would the church of Jesus Christ have if all those who call on the name of Jesus could just worship together? Be unified in the mission that God has given us and not be so caught up in our personal preference about how it should go, what it should look like, what it should sound like, how people should come, what they should do when they arrive. Just unified on the mission. We want to be about making and maturing disciples of Jesus. That's the mission. That's what he's given us to do. How are we going to do that and not be caught up in all the other stuff that could distract us, that could divide us? No, we're not going to be 
focusing on that. We're focused on this, making and maturing disciples of Jesus. That's what we want to do. That's, that's who we want to be. How are we doing that? How effectively are we doing that? How are we calling people to do that? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you understand what discipleship is? Are you maturing in that? Do you know what the steps are that you need to take to move from where you are to where you need to go? Are you understanding what this looks like? This is what we want to be about. All the other stuff will just divide us and will confuse our message and will confuse those that are watching. Let's just be about Jesus. Let's just do what he asks us to do. Let's be faithful to his call. Let's not get caught up in doing the things that we want to do. Let's just go where he wants us to go. The gospel pulls people together under a unified mission. Verses 6 through 9 of chapter 2, it says, From those who seem to be influential, this is Paul's way of saying, I don't care what their title is. In fact, he says that in parentheses, what they are makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those who seem influential, he's talking about the disciples, those who were part of the original 12, Peter, James, and John specifically. When those who seemed influential, those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. By the way, they did not change my message at all. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised in the same way that Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for the one who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the, to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, that's Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me that we should go to the Gentiles and them to the circumcised, that we would go to the people that God has called us to in order to make and mature disciples of Jesus. That's what God called us to do. You do it there. I'm gonna do it here. We'll each get in our lane. We'll do our thing. It's not that we're working against each other. We're actually working together. You have your audience. I'm gonna go after these people, but we're gonna be targeted. We're gonna be focused on the one that God has given us to do. And we're gonna be unified in the mission that he's given us to do. You go there, that's fine. We don't have to do the exact same thing to the exact same people, but whatever we do to wherever we go, our message better be the same. That it's all about Jesus, not about the law. That it's all about Jesus, not about our preference. That it's all about Jesus. That's what Paul wants to be sure they understand. If the message is the same, the gospel will do this. It will pull people together and it will unify the mission even if the target is a little bit different. Even if the audience that it goes to is a little bit different. Because you know what we need? We need gospel-centered people going to every audience in the world. Every person in the world. Every group of people in the world. Every subculture in the world. Every land in the world. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation needs to hear the gospel. And the gospel they need to hear is Jesus, not America. Jesus needs to be great again. Amen. Jesus in our land. Jesus around the world. Jesus in every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. Because you know what Revelation says? That's what heaven's going to look like anyway. Why would we not work towards that right now? Right? Let's go. Let's do it. Let's be a part of the mission that God has given us to do. Let's be unified around the mission because that's what the gospel does. It pulls us together regardless of where we go so that we're doing the same thing. And then finally, the gospel, number four, always has an eye towards the needy. The last thing he says, verse 10, it feels like a throwaway verse. It's not. It's super important. Only thing they asked us to remember was the poor. Paul says, the very thing I was eager to do. I'll show you how we were unified. <laughs> we were unified because even if he goes to the circumcised and I go to the uncircumcised, the most important thing that we need to do is make sure that we're not forgetting the poor people around us. Make sure that we're not forgetting those who are destitute around us. Make sure that we're not forgetting, overlooking, not paying attention to those who are in need. It does not make sense to be upset about a political system that cares for others when the church doesn't do it. You can't get upset about a government system that says, I'm going to go care for these people, I'm going to look after them, I'm going to provide a welfare, I'm going to do this, if the church is unwilling to do it. The church should be leading the way. We should be leading the way. 
Our sacrifices, our gifts, our time, our energy, our attention should be for those who need help. Those who are hurting, those who are poor, those who need relief, widows, orphans, and our distress. What are we doing to help them? The gospel always has an eye towards the needy. The very thing that Paul says, I was already eager to do. Friends, there's so much more that could be said about this passage. So much more that could be dissected and pulled apart. But the point is this. Jesus is the gospel. He's our good news. He's our champion and he's our hope. Amen? We gather to be equipped, to be edified, but gathering is not the point. It's not the end game. Gathering is the preparation to go. The great commission of Jesus is not come and sit and listen and sing. The great commission of Jesus is go into all the earth, make disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. I'm going to be with you. Don't worry about it. I got you. But you got to go. You got to go. And the conviction of my heart as I'm being just transparent in front of you is that I'm not going enough personally. I'm not doing, I'm not going enough. You say, don't say you're not doing enough because that puts it on law. No, I'm not saying I'm being subservient to the law. I'm saying that Jesus commanded it and therefore I need to be about it. If Jesus said it's important, then I need to be about it. And what I'm confessing before you is that I haven't been about it enough. I haven't been about it enough. And I want that to change in me. And I want that to change in you. And I want that to change in us. And I want us to be a church that cares for this community and is on mission because Jesus has unified us through his good news. Father, this is your word and your truth. I ask you to do with it what only you can do. Holy Spirit, would you move in this place and in our hearts and may we be a people who are not content to leave this place exactly how we walked in. I don't believe you would be content, Father, for us to leave this place exactly how we walked in. This is a place of transformation. You are a God of change. So God, we ask that you would change us, that you would shape us, that you would mold us, and that you would form us into the image of Christ that you have for us. And may we exalt the name of Jesus as we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I want you to know I love you. I just want to say that to you. I think about you. I pray for you. I'm encouraged by you. Um, Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, Thank you for your prayers for our team. Um, And as we continue to be shaped by God, uh, I want to hear from you as much as I want you to hear from me. I don't want this to be just the place where I talk. I want to hear from you. So I invite you, if you ever have something that's on your heart, something that God is saying to you, um, something that you want to respond to, something that I've said up here, or just that you just sense, like, man, I want to say this. Would you please find me and would we get together and I'll buy you a cup of coffee? And I always tell people the first one's on me, the second one's on you. So <laughs> let's get together and get to know each other and walk life together as we pursue the mission that God has for us. Amen. God bless you. Have a fantastic day in the name of Jesus. Amen.